Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's an honor to be here and to be a part of the Anatolian Festival. Uh, I have been to the real Anatolia a few times, and it is worth visiting. So if you have not had the opportunity to actually go there, imagine all of these tiles that are in uh, photographic kind of reproduction, the real thing. And uh, it, it just is an amazing place in, in so many ways, artistically, historically, religiously, and uh, it's something very special. There are um, 21 synagogues in Istanbul uh, today, still. So there is a substantial uh, Jewish community in Turkey, not, uh, this not counting in Ankara and other cities as well. So there is a, a significant Jewish community still in, in uh, Turkey, it is probably one of the only um, Muslim countries in which Jews feel comfortable and are really uh, engaged and involved. So uh, I'm very proud of that, very happy about that, and uh, it's just something to take note of. So uh, my mission, which I chose to accept, was to talk about uh, scriptural foundations of Muslim-Jewish dialogue and coexistence according to sacred texts. A formal lecture, but I'm going to give you a semi-formal introduction, and then we're going to take a look at some texts, and then we're going to discuss it. Okay? The, the mo even more important than the texts themselves is the framing, I hope, that I'm going to give you, because it helps us understand how texts, how scriptural texts, sacred texts are read. So one of the most, or many, difficulties that anyone um, faces when trying to determine what a religion teaches about any topic is that there is rarely one single absolutely consistent position about anything in religion. I mean, you can, there are some basics, like if you're a monotheistic religion, you say God is one. Everyone agrees about that. But exactly what that means to individuals within a religion or between religions is often substantially different. So religions are extremely complex. When religions hold particular views about a topic, they often hold counter views as well. Religions have a tendency to develop and hone their positions. And that development sometimes results in changes, even substantial changes about the issue that is under review. And religion is always and entirely a mixture of the human and the divine. God is at the core and center of religion, of course. But think about this for a moment. God's words to humanity in the form of scripture are always interpreted by humans, always read by humans, and made sense of by human beings. There is no reading without interpretation. So every single religious teaching or message that you receive is a mixture of divine and human. It comes, the source is the divine, but by the time it gets to you and me, it is mediated by human intelligence and thinking and engagement. This is religion at its best. Sometimes in religious pronouncements, not at its best, it may even be difficult to find the divine element in religion because it is so removed from the essential core. So when somebody looks at Christianity, for example, and I'm using Christianity because I'm not going to be treating it here in any uh, significant way today, one can make the case that Christianity is a peaceful religion, and one can also make the case that Christianity is a violent religion. If you approach the topic historically, you can see where Christians turn the other cheek rather than respond violently to the horrible persecution that Christians suffered under the Roman Empire. But if you looked at another period or other periods of history, you would also see many occasions when Christians indiscriminately slaughtered religious competitors, such as Jews or Muslims or even other Christians who held beliefs that were considered unacceptable to the church. So what is it? Is Christianity inherently a religion that resolves issues peacefully? Or is it a religion that resolves issues through violence? 
I'll let you make your own decision about this. In fact, you probably already have made your own decision, and whatever position you have about this particular topic is probably influenced by whether or not you are a believing Christian. Think about that for a moment. It's a, not meant as an accusation, but our very identity informs how we interpret and see our own religious tradition. We love our tradition and feel that it is me deeply meaningful to us. We judge it, as we say in Jewish um, discourse, lechav schut. There is a, a notion that everything is judged like uh, a scale, right? And there's one piece of the scale which is for the item that's being judged, and the other uh, piece is for the weight, right? To, to determine if it's heavy or too heavy, not heavy enough. And there's another way to look at the scale, and that is that you look at the scale in terms of absolute uh, uh, strict responsibility, uh, by which if anybody was judged, you'd be judged guilty, because we're all guilty of sins and errors and serious problems. Or you judge with great humility and with compassion. And that's the kath zechut, we say. So we tend to judge our own tradition more lovingly and with the humility and compassion. And we tend to judge the tradition of the other, whoever that other might be, with less humility and less compassion. So on the topic of Jewish-Muslim dialogue and coexistence, there are two major positions. And when I say major positions, these are dialectical positions or positions that in the highfalutin fan fancy language of the academy would be, uh, we'd say, ideal typical positions, meaning that they're two like standard positions. Neither of them are absolutely true, but they kind of reflect um, uh, uh, two sides of the coin. And both of them are, because they aren't actually true, both of them are in essence wrong but they're important to think about. One position has it that Jews and Muslims have almost always been in conflict. Uh, the other is that Jews and Muslims have almost always lived together with great harmony. Neither of them are exactly true. Interestingly, some Jews and some Muslims find perfect agreement about both positions. I'll give you an example of how this works. This is a kind of thought exercise. Right? Let's take the first position. There are Muslims in the world who believe that the Jews expended tremendous resources to prevent the true prophet Muhammad from succeeding in his divinely authorized role of apostle of God. Jews undermined him, physically fought against him, or tried to assassinate him. And they joined the early community of Muslims hypocritically in order to try to destroy the movement from within. There are Islamic texts in the Quran and the Hadith that Muslims point to in order to support their position. I'm not saying that these texts prove that position, but they are pointed to by Muslims, not all Muslims, some Muslims, to take that position. So according to these Muslims, the ones who hold this position, the ominous beginning described here continued one way or another in history because Jews tried to weaken or destroy the Muslim community wherever they could. Now, some Jews agree with the general view that Jews and Muslims have always been in conflict, but they find a different reason, as they read the same sources, some of the same sources that are cited by Muslims in the position I just articulated. And their reading of these sources, they see that the Jews of Arabia did not believe that Muhammad was the prophet of God, which was their right as believers in a religious tradition, and they were therefore, because they didn't accept Muhammad's prophethood, they were persecuted and they were fought and killed and eventually violently uprooted from Arabia for the simple reason that they disagreed with his religious claims and views. And because Islamic law requires that non-Muslims live in a secondary status under the caliphate, Jews did not have the same rights and privileges and responsibilities as Muslims. Therefore, while some Jews and Muslims agree that Jews and Muslims have always been in conflict, each side believes that the other side is completely and fully at fault. Are you following me? Okay. Now there are also Muslims and Jews who agree that they have lived together in great harmony and they take their cues from the experience in what some have called the golden age in Spain and in other Muslim countries 
intermittently during the Middle Ages. And it is true that there were plenty of occasions during the Middle Ages when Jews and Muslims functioned together quite well. But truthfully, the pre-modern world, and this is something that's very important to keep in mind, the pre-modern world was very different than our world. While under the great Muslim empires, very many different ethnic and racial and religious groups lived together under relative harmony. That is true, but it's not the kind of harmony that we would seek today in a truly pluralistic environment. This is not a condemnation of Islam. In fact, the Christian world was, in general, far less harmonious with regard to intergroup relations than the Muslim world. I hope this is raising some questions and you're willing to challenge me on these things because I do want to have an open discussion about this. Not a debate, just an open discussion, okay? But it was normal in the pre-modern world it was normal in the pre-modern world for one community to be privileged above all other communities. In the Muslim world, it was Muslims. And not all Muslims, really, but Muslims who practiced Islam as those who were in power practiced Islam. If you practiced a different expression of Islam, you didn't have the same kind of privileges, you didn't have the same kind of uh, position in society. It was the same in the Christian world. And you can bet I'm talking as a Jew, right? Jews didn't have this problem. Why didn't they have this problem? Because they didn't have a big government and a kingdom. But you can bet, and I'm speaking as a Jew now, if Jews had a kingdom and a caliphate and a, 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 an empire, they would be no different than the Christians or the Muslims. They would privilege Jews over others because that's what people did in the pre-modern world. It ha there were different expectations of how things worked. I know for a fact that it was this way also under the Chinese dynastic empires. And I suspect, although I haven't done the research, that it was so in India as well under the Hindu kingdoms. So both of these positions, everything was terrible, everything was wonderful, are wrong. Jews and Muslims neither lived together in wonderful harmony, nor did they live together under almost constant conflict. The truth as always, is more complex. Sometimes Muslim-Jewish relations were excellent, sometimes terrible, but mostly they were somewhere in between. Having said that, my job today is to think about scriptural foundations for Muslim-Jewish dialogue and coexistence. There are indeed scriptural texts that can be understood to promote Muslim-Jewish dialogue and coexistence. But keep in mind that there are also countertexts that can be understood to discourage Muslim-Jewish dialogue and coexistence. I'm not going to go and look at those texts because you can find a lot of them on the blogosphere. There's a lot of hate material on the blogosphere that will tell you that Islam is an evil religion, that Judaism is, is an evil religion, and that Christianity is an evil religion, and you basically, you name it, you'll find it. So. Um, I'm not going to look there. Instead, we're going to look at some of the texts that might be understood to be promoting dialogue and coexistence, and then we can have an open discussion about it. Does that sound reasonable? Yes. Okay. Anybody have any questions so far about anything I've said or challenge to anything I've said? You'll all get an A on the test. If, if you don't challenge me, you all get an A on the test. Okay. Now, do we have those texts? Are they ready? Oh, I thought we were going to, I wanted to make copies. Ah, uh, this is the only text we have. Oh, 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 I thought, do we have a, um, oh, we misunderstood one another. Okay, so, um, do we have somewhere where we can project the texts, perhaps? Somebody? No. I, I don't have an extra copy. Uh, it's two pages, but you can do it on one piece of paper. It's, uh, if you can, uh, if I can keep it for the presentation, I can make it separate. Yeah, I think we're going to have to do it without it, I think. I think, you know, how long will it take? I can do that. Because I don't really have, so maybe we should just not do it. I don't think, I, don't, I think we'll just read it. Okay, okay. So, yeah, I think we missed it. No.
no problem. Okay, so um, now, how do we do this? Let's see. Uh, I'm reading the text, and whenever, I, whenever anybody, think about this, right? Whenever anyone reads a text, we're reading it in a language that we all understand. So I'm not going to be reading it in Hebrew for the Bible. I'm not going to be reading it in Arabic for the Quran. I'm not going to be reading it in Aramaic for the Talmud. So it's all translation. Islam had the most brilliant view of translation, more brilliant than Christians or Jews. And that view is there is no such thing as translation. <laughs> you cannot translate anything because translation means, we assume it means, that you're conveying the meaning that exists in one language, the exact same meaning to another language. But we know that that never really happens. If you just look at the Bible, which has probably had more eyes and more brains engaged in translation than any other text in the world, you will see many different translations of the same verse, and they come out sometimes meaning significantly different things. So typically, you'll find there's a Jewish version of the Old Testament, which Jews call the Hebrew Bible, and there's a Christian version of the Old Testament, both in English, and they will be different. They won't be the same. Not only will they be slightly different because of different synonyms, but they'll convey slightly different meaning. Right? So there is no real translation. Every translation is interpretation. So if you want to understand what a religious text is really saying to you, if you want to understand what religious believers believe is God's message to humanity, you want to understand it in an Islamic context, you'd better learn Arabic. If you want to understand it in a Jewish context, you'd better learn Hebrew. If you want to understand it in a Christian context, you'd better learn Greek. Not so easy, right? But even if you do know it, there are many words in Arabic that the Arabic commentators on the Quran didn't understand or didn't understand fully. So there are thousands and thousands of volumes of commentary on the meaning, on the pure literal meaning of the words uh, of the Quran in a huge genre, major library of books called tafsir. Same in Judaism and same in Christianity. So with all that in mind, let me read to you a couple of, uh, uh, of verses. Um, this is from the Hebrew Bible. And this is going to be uh, a text, I'm, I'm warning you, these are texts that are supportive of, of dialogue, of openness to others. We can find texts also in our tradition which are not very supportive to openness. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 10. This is a continuing discussion. For the Lord your God is the God of all gods and the Lord of all lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who shows no favor and takes no bribe, but upholds the cause of the orphan and the widow and befriends the non-native and in the ancient world uh, Israelite defined na nationality and religion. Uh, there was no difference. We'll talk about that if you're interested. So, because God befriends the, the stranger, providing him with food and clothing. You too must befriend the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You must hold the Lord your God in awe. Only him shall you worship. To him shall you hold fast and by his name shall you swear." Okay? A nice text. And there is a counter text that says that you shouldn't trust the stranger, right? Be careful, the Moabites and the Canaanite, Canaanites and the other people. But there is a, a statement in the Torah that occurs 39 times, and, it, it, and that statement is found in this um, paragraph. More than the statement that you should love the Lord your God, which is a standard statement that is uh, recited uh, daily, uh, twice a day in Jewish prayer. Every Jew is obligated by religious law to say that you should love God. Uh, that is found once and can be understood to be found more than once, once or twice, but there's only one statement that really says that in the Torah. But it says in the Torah 39 times, you should love the stranger because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. 
That is an entree to engaging in dialogue and to being in relationship with others. Now, let me give you one from the Quran. O humankind, this is from Surah 49. This is the 49th chapter of the Quran, verse 13. God speaking. O humankind, we, and God speaks in the royal we, in the, in the majestic we. So it's not a pluralist God, not a pluralism of God, not a, not a group of gods speaking, but the one God speaking in a majestic form. O humankind, we have created you, male and female, and have made you nations and tribes that you may know one another. The noblest of you in the sight of God is the best in God consciousness or in piety. God is the one who knows, who is aware. That suggests to me, I'm, now I'm telling you what it means, right? So if you had this text in front of you, you would have more personal volition to be able to interpret the text, but I'm, now I'm sort of have to tell you what I think it means, and therefore I'm distorting it, right? Because the, the, only, the, the closest way to be non-distortive of the text is to simply allow you to read it and not to tell you what I think it means. So maybe I won't. <laughs> yes? Maybe you could give your version and maybe others could give theirs. Okay, okay. So if God created humans as uh, specifically with different genders, and in different nations and tribes, and, and God said out loud, I have made you different from one another so that you should know one another. To me, that means there should be no universal totalitarian system. God created humans to be independent, thinkers. We can't help but think differently from one another. In every community you have, you have differences of, of opinion, you have disagreements. That's life. The question is how to live in a community where we have differences and we respect our differences in such a way that we can still function as a group and yet respect our differences. And that's the really tough thing. That's really tough. But this seems to be, my, this is my view, this is the message of God here in this Quranic verse. I'm sure there are many more messages that can be derived from this as well. Any, anyone have a comment or reaction for either of these statements? Yes. I would just say that what it means to me is that you know everyone's going to be different, and so in that case, that God said, "Well, there are some of you who are more spiritual, and so I'm, you know, you are, you are the ones that are more what, what was the word? Oh, a pious or God-fearing God, yeah." Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, great, great. Any, any, yes? Focusing on similarities is more important than finding the differences. Not everyone is individual by himself, but uh, again, you can find the similarities and yes. make a more peaceful world. Right. Yes. I think the proper phrase is diversity. The diversity is less. Can everyone hear you? I'm not sure if they can. Diversity is a blessing, not a curse. Not a curse, yes. Yes. I would actually take it even further. Um, I, I, we are trained, many of us in our traditions, we're trained to accept the commonalities. We're all human. We have so, so many things in common with one another. We aspire to the same things. We have the same needs. We all need to be loved. We all need to eat and have shelter. We all need respect. And so we find these commonalities and we tr really center on the commonalities. I think that is a good gesture and important. But I would go further than that. I would say we should learn the differences and not just ignore them. We should even celebrate them. We should do like what we have, exactly what is happening today, why you are here. You are here to celebrate difference because you are coming to an Anatolian festival. For all of the people here who don't have experience with Turkish culture, uh, you're here because you want to know about the differences, because you want to celebrate the differences, and that's exactly what this program is about. You're hearing the music of celebration. It's, lo it's, it's a loving music. You're eating the food. It's a celebratory act, and I think it's important for us 
to teach in our schools more and more how to celebrate the differences, not only find the commonalities. I mean, the commonalities are important too, but what if you're really just different? What if we're just not going to agree? Can I still love you or really respect you? And I think we have to learn how to do that even when we cannot see eye to eye. I have a, a very close friend who keeps saying to me, if you only understood what I mean, you'll agree with me. <laughs> Just, you know, so he says it again and again and again and again, and I keep saying, you know, I really understand what you mean, and I don't agree with you. <laughs> so then you didn't understand what he means. Exactly. <laughs> Because you would, have to, you would have to agree with me, because I'm right, right? Don't we all feel this way? At some level, we kind of feel like, if you only understood what I really meant by this, you would have to agree with me. OK. So here's another one. Um, this is from uh, the book of Micah, which is in the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish Bible. This is a very interesting um, text, and it's a long one. So. Bear with me, close your eyes, relax, I'm going to read. It's going to take a few minutes, but the, the last line is the best line. But you need to hear the previous, though. So don't fade out too quickly. This is chapter four of the book of Micah. In the days to come, the mount of the house of the Lord shall stand firm above the mountains and tower above the hills, and all the nations shall gaze on it with joy. And the many peoples shall go and say, Come, let us go up to the mount of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may instruct us in his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For instruction shall go forth from Zion, and the word of God from Jerusalem. Thus God will judge among the nations and arbitrate for the many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they again know war. Everyone shall sit under their grapevine or fig tree with no one to disturb them. For it was the God of Israel, or the God, the Lord of hosts, who spoke. And here's the last line. Though all the peoples walk each in the names of its gods, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. So what do you think of that? It's hard to respond when you don't have the text in front of you. But I wonder what you think about it. I'll let it be. Yeah. Sorry? Tolerance. Teaching tolerance. Yeah. Anyone else have any thoughts about it? I've studied this a little bit so I can give you some response. Don't, anything I say this afternoon, don't believe me. <laughs> Take it as one position, okay? I'm, I'm, I, I work my entire life on, in studying religion. I, I do uh, read and speak Hebrew and Arabic, and so I do read the text in their original forms, but not Greek, so I'm, I don't claim to any expertise in, in uh, uh, New Testament studies, although I read it a lot in translation. Uh, but I am only a person, and I am maybe wrong. I may be mistaken. So and when anybody, I hope you'll always take this attitude when somebody stands up here in the podium or on the, you know, uh, giving the sermon or the speech that you, you say, this is an opinion. This is not capital T truth. So in general, at least among the three great monotheistic systems of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, there is no discouragement for marrying people of different races, of different ethnicities, uh, at all. There is more uh, difficulty when you're marrying someone of a different religious tradition, and I'll get to that in a moment, okay? So first of all, there is no distinction between nations, races, languages, 
ethnic groups in any of the religions. And I need to go in a little bit more detail on Judaism because Judaism has been condemned um, occasionally in history as being a kind of elitist, racist uh, tradition. And it, it really isn't. Judaism has always accepted converts. So people can become Jewish. Some people think that Jews don't accept anyone who isn't Jewish already. You can convert to Judaism. It's just that Judaism has not been a missionizing religion. It hasn't gone out to try to get people to become Jewish. And so some people historically have seen that as, an, as a kind of snobbishness as opposed to going out and saying, look, I have good news for you. You know, you can find salvation through my tr religious uh, beliefs, and so you should come and become like me. Jews have said, our tradition has always said, we, we don't interfere with your belief system. You do what you wish, and you, we don't agree with you, but it doesn't mean, you don't have to agree with us. And there's even a famous statement, which I'm going to quote from rabbinic tradition, that says, Gentiles, according to Judaism, if you don't believe in Jewish, Jewish religion, you still can uh, get salvation if you're a righteous person. So the, the determination is not faith, but righteous behavior, right? So I'm, I'm spending a little more time on Judaism defensively because Judaism has been accused as being racist. So Jews accept, and if you look in the Jewish world, because in America, most of the Jews who have immigrated to America come from a particular area of Europe, Jews tend to look similar. I don't look at all Jewish, you may notice. But, uh, so, um, but if in, there are Jews uh, if, that have been living in Africa for many, many, many centuries, for millennia. And so there are black Jews, and there are uh, Arab Jews, and there are Berber Jews, and there are Chinese Jews, and there are Jews of all kinds of different ethnic and racial characteristics. We just don't see them so much in this country. But if you go to Israel, for example, you'll see lots and lots of Jews of different types. Now, on the issue of, uh, of marriage between religions, that's more of a problem. And uh, um, I can say that in the Jewish tradition, uh, Judaism frowns, is against marrying uh, people of another religious tradition because of the fear that the children will grow up and not, no longer carry out the faith tradition. Uh, in Islam, th that's the general perspective. In Islam, the general perspective is that Muslim men can marry non-Muslim women. There's not a problem with that. And if you're a non-Muslim woman, if you're a Christian or a Jew, the Muslim man is obligated by religious law to make all effort to allow and to encourage his wife to attend church or synagogue and to observe her festivals. Right? So that is built into the Islamic system. Um, but, Jew, but Muslim women are not, by uh, Islamic law, are not uh, allowed to marry non-Muslim men. And the reason is really, in again, with children. Uh, because, because in Islam, the, uh, the identity of the child is determined generally through the identity of the father. So if the father is a Muslim, the child is raised as a Muslim. In Jewish tradition, the identity of a child is according to the identity of the mother. So if the mother is a Jew, the child is a Jew. So what happens when you get a um, Jewish woman marrying a Muslim man? You get a very interesting situation. <laughs> And I actually do know some people who, uh, have, whose mothers are Jewish and who fa whose fathers are Muslim, and they're a little bit uh, uh, confused. <laughs> yeah, yeah, understandably, yeah. OK. So where are we? So now, uh, any other comments about uh, these texts? OK, I, uh, let me give you one more, and then we'll have a kind of open discussion. Well, actually, before that, I do want to, I want to say something about the Micah text. I read the Micah text that we just read a little bit differently. Let me just repeat. In the days to come, the mount of the Lord's house shall stand firm above the mountains and tower above the hills, and all the nations shall gaze on it with joy. Many people shall go and say, come, let us go out to the, up to the mount of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may instruct us in his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For instruction shall come forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. God will judge among the nations and arbitrate for the many peoples. So I actually read this as a kind of totalitarian text. I see. Um, this is not the way it's traditionally read in Jewish circles. But I actually see this as more of a text saying that in the future, everyone is going to agree with us. 
they're going to accept God as we understand God, the God of Jacob, right? The God of Israel in Jerusalem, the mountain of the Lord, not from Mecca, not from Rome or the Vatican, right? But from Jerusalem. And everyone is going to do it our way. And I don't think that is a pluralistic text. I think that's more of a totalitarian text. Now, this text, interestingly enough, occurs word for word in another prophetic book of the Bible in Isaiah. But it doesn't have the last line. So what I think happened here is something very interesting. I think there was an argument between two prophets. One prophet said, you know, our God is the God of the universe. And there can only be one God in the world because there's a unitary notion of everybody. We're all children of God. We're all part of this wonderful experiment, which is life on Earth. And we should all recognize the one true God and not be worshiping idols or, you know, whatever from this perspective. And uh, the only way you can understand it is to, is to worship our God. Now, the context for that statement is a world in which there was no monotheism aside from Israelite religion. Every single religion in the world at that time that was known, certainly known to people here or even to us, was polytheistic. And this prophet was so convinced that there is one God, a sense of unity among all peoples, that we should all be worshiping the same God. And there's only one way to understand that one unity of God, and that's Judaism or Israelite religion. So you should all do it our way. So it's understandable why it might be totalitarian, but it is, I think, totalitarian. But there's this one verse at the end doesn't exist in the Isaiah version of the prophecy. It stops where it says everyone shall basically accept the one God of the universe. But then this one verse is added on here, and I'll read you this one more time. Though all the peoples walk each in the names of its gods, we will walk in the name of the Lord, our God, and that's the name of God as understood by Israel, Israelites, forever and ever. So here we have a very interesting, uh, I think, expression of pluralism, which is even to the extent that you, if you believe in your gods, even if they aren't true by our standards, you will do it. We are not going to try to change you, but we are going to be loyal to our understanding of what, it, what is truth and what is unity in the universe. And I think that is a profound statement. So anyway, that's my own little take on this. Yes? When you read the part about going up to the mountain, I kind of thought evangelism on a vast, that maybe we were going to take people up to the mountain. I, I think, it, yes, I think there's a possibility there. Uh, the, you know, you know why Judaism doesn't, isn't missionizing? There are two reasons, historically. This is, again, this is my historical opinion, right, from my scholarship. I think there are two reasons why Judaism is not proselytizing, whereas Christianity and Islam are inherently proselytizing. The first reason is because Judaism started out, like every religion in the ancient Near East, as being tribal. Religion equaled tribe. Every tribe had its own god, a tribal god. So the Moabites had a god that they worshiped named Kamosh. There were other gods in the universe, the gods of fertility, gods of weather, but they also had a tribal god. And the Israelites had a god too called the god of Israel. In the ancient, ancient, earliest layers of the Bible, Israel, Israelites were not monotheistic. They were polytheistic, or what we call monolatrous or henotheistic. That means that you believe that there's only one God that's good for you, but there are other gods out there. That's not pure monotheism. Right? Later, and that was natural because all the peoples had this view of a tribal God and other gods in the world. For some reason that we don't know, the Israelites understood or came to view through revelation or if you want to be suspicious about revelation through other historical means, came to the idea or the position or the belief that there must be one God that created all of us. And that was, a, we know from the Bible itself, it gives us lots of evidence that that transition from, from henotheism or believing we, 
Israelites have one tribal god, but there are other gods out there, but we don't care about those gods, we only care about our god, to the notion that those gods that are out there aren't real gods at all. That transition took a long period of time, and not all the Israelites accepted it. Some of them did, some of them didn't, and it was not until late, until about the time of the destruction of the first temple, that the whole community as a whole was truly monotheistic. So, <clears throat> so there is a mentality built into Israelite religion, which is tribal. So even though, now there are no more Israelites, you know, they're Jews, we, right? And Judaism is a continuation of Israelite religion. And there remains in Judaism a, an essence of that tribal identity. It's just sort of there, it's deeply embedded. Because when you read the text of the Torah, there's a lot of kind of tribal, tribal uh, culture in that. So Jews have this kind of tribal, a little bit of a tribal mentality. It doesn't mean that they don't accept people into the position or that anybody of other tribes or other races or other uh, ethnicities can become Jewish. But it's just because it's such an ancient part of the tradition. So that's one reason why Jews, I think, didn't really go out to proselytize very much. There's another reason, too, and that is that when uh, uh, there was a period of time when Jews did proselytize, but when the Jews uh, kind of lost the battle for the Roman Empire and the Roman Empire became a Christianized Roman Empire, it was forbidden, it was illegal to proselytize if you were Jewish. And, and the penalty for proselytizing was, was capital punishment, was death. So, so Jews who were caught proselytizing in the Byzantine world, in the Christian Roman world, were killed for it. And that, that became also a rule in Islam. If you were caught proselytizing Judaism or Christianity in the Muslim world, it was a capital offense. And so that really stopped Jews from proselytizing. It was a pretty effective uh, measure. Uh, Christians continued to proselytize because there was a, a big Christian world that was beyond the Muslim world, right? So outside of Islam, the Muslim world, Christians could continue to proselytize. But there was no, at this point, there was no point of the world that was under control of Jews. So Jews were always under the pressure not to share their religion in public. And so that is probably the two, those are probably the two reasons why Jews, Judaism was not a proselytizing religion. But just as Christians generally believe their religion is better than other religions, and Muslims generally believe their religion is better than other religions, and they should. Christians and Muslims should because it's their religion. So too do most Jews believe their religion is better than other religions. Intellectually, you may have a problem with it, but spiritually, you tend to feel it. That's the way you feel it. Yes, do you have a question or comment? A good, that's a good question, and I, uh, it happened in a period of time of about two or three hundred years, and there were periods in which the Israelite community was under great pressure, military and political pressure, and then there was also periods when they were in good shape, because it was a long period of time. And that's a, that would be a great um, topic to write a PhD dissertation on sometime. So. Yeah, or, you know, yeah, something. yeah, interesting, yes. So let me, let me give you another uh, citation from the Quran, because there's some wonderful uh, uh, citations from the Quran. I am now speaking also, you know, I'm, I'm speaking as, a, as an academic, but I'm also speaking as a Jew. I think of the three uh, scriptural traditions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, I think there is no question that the Quran has more verses in it that are open to pluralism and to other religious traditions, at least monotheistic traditions, than you'll find in either the New Testament or the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. And I think that's significant, especially because in our day, Muslims are getting a very bad rap in America and in the West. Uh, but 
but the, the scripture of Islam is the most pluralistic, more pluralistic, certainly than the New Testament, which is not very pluralistic, and more pluralistic than the Hebrew Bible, which is also not terribly pluralistic, but a little bit more, has a, a slightly better record, I think, than the, than the New Testament. So let me read to you another one. I could have chosen many more as well. Um, Uh, so here's actually a, a statement from the chapter 42 of the Quran, uh, verse 15, in which the context is um, God speaking either to Muhammad or to his community to go out and to mission, to missionize, to witness, to proselytize. But, but listen to how it's done. Therefore call, it's dawah, call to the faith and be upright as you have been commanded. Do not follow their desires, but say, I believe in what God has revealed from a book and have been commanded to be just among you. Allah is our Lord and your Lord. We have our works and you have yours. There's no argument between us and you. God will bring us together for the journey is to him. I think that's a very, very, very deep and very important. Uh, verse. I, I'm probably out of time. Do you want to just, um, oh no, I have a little more time. Oh. Uh, yeah, okay, so let's just um, open this up for a general discussion on whatever. Yes. What would you say to someone who says that religion is the cause of all of problems? Okay, did you hear the question? This is a great question. What would you say to someone who says religion is the cause of all our problems? I would say that the person who has that position is, is really mistaken. So let me explain to you why. Uh, religion is an extremely, has been proven by history to be an extremely effective way to mobilize large numbers of people to engage in extraordinary behavior. I'm trying to say this neutrally. History has proven religion to be an extremely effective way to mobilize very large numbers of peoples to engage in extraordinary behavior. That behavior can be as it was in, in, for many years in the Christian world to go into the, where the plague is at its worst and go and heal the sick and take care of the people because that's your duty. And people against, against their own personal best interests gave up their lives in order to do the right thing. We're talking about thousands and thousands of people who did this throughout the Roman Empire. And um, as you know, religion has also been very effective in mobilizing large numbers of people to engage in horribly violent acts against other people. That is what I believe is a kind of hijacking of religion for other causes because at the base, and a lot of work has been done on this on the Crusades, for example. The Crusades, are, is seen kind of in the popular imagination as a great movement of Christian armies to reconquer the Holy Land from the, from the uh, what is it, from the, uh, the barbarian Turks and to take it back to the true, to the true believers. And this was a, a deep and important uh, uh, spiritual endeavor and it resulted in huge massacres of people. The, when the Crusaders, by the way, when the Crusaders got to Jerusalem, they killed everybody in Jerusalem. Everybody, they killed everyone. Everyone who was dressed oriental, didn't look European, was killed. And so that meant tens of thousands of Jews and Christians who were living in Jerusalem. But they were dressed like orientals, because they were, right? And so that was, it was horrible. It was a horrible, terrible engagement. Now, in the, in the last 100 years, it's been so many books and articles written on the Crusades, and it's very interesting. There were political issues. There were demographic issues. I could go into them in detail if you want because it's something that's very interesting to me. There were too many children being born, and there wasn't enough work for them. Send them out on a crusade. There were too many errant knights around, and there weren't you know, enough damsels in distress, and there were no more dragons to, to go after. And so they were like shooting up the neighborhood and, uh, and, and, and stealing, uh, kidnapping women and, and raping and pillaging and doing bad things. Uh, send them out to a war somewhere else. Get, them, get rid of those guys. <coughs> there, were, 
There was uh, uh, the, the uh, Italian city-states were expanding and were trying to uh, develop beachheads in the Middle East for trade, and they were encouraging people to go there. There was a great growth of piety and, and uh, the giving of indulgences in the church at the time, and there were people who were sent out to go to, to uh, be redeemed from their sins by take, making a pilgrimage, and, um, but they were being robbed on the pilgrimage. So they said, well, we need to protect, let's, let's create outposts to develop our, to um, increase our influence there. And the person who called the crusade, Pope Urban II, called the crusade from uh, Avignon in France because he had been kicked out of the Vatican by a counter, uh, counter um, a pope who had more power in Italy than he did, so he kicked him out. And one of the ways in which Urban was able to get a, a tremendous support was to call a crusade and have hundreds of thousands of people marching under the banner of Christ. And so this was a political issue. So there were, it wasn't just politics, and it wasn't just political infighting among the popes. It was also economic issues and demographic issues and trade issues and a lot of other things that pushed the crusade at that particular time. Because you would have asked the question, why did the crusades happen in the 11th century when the Muslims took the holy places in Jerusalem 600 years before that? So why wasn't there a crusade in order to take them back beforehand if this was just a religious endeavor? So there were a lot of other issues involved. So, so that, that's sort of my example of a long answer. But religion has been used um, to, and it's not all cynical. Sometimes religion is used because, because there's real inequity and there's a need to, uh, there, there's a sense of evil out there. And the evil might be not just an issue of moral evil, it could be economic oppression and people are mobilizing uh, troops and people to engage in it. But I don't think that religion by itself is the cause. It's the means. It's the mobilization. You know, to me, uh, we don't say much by saying we need to be in peace among each other. And if there is a real God out there, there's only one true religion. Yes, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah, okay, so let's say, uh, that's a good question. There's one God, there must be one truth, right? And so a Jew and a Muslim and a Christian are sitting at the table together and trying to determine which one is the right one. Right? Well, you could do the same thing within Islam. You could get three different Muslims. No, sit in, yeah, okay. But, but even if you do believe, if you believe you're right, if you are truly a deep believer in your religious tradition, and you know you're right. Let's just say you don't even believe it. You know it. You're right. My question is, how can you have the arrogance to say that everybody else in the world is wrong or that everybody who disagrees with me is wrong? I'm not suggesting you, okay? I'm just saying the, the person who says this. Because if God is truly as great and grand, omniscient, omnipotent as, as our religious traditions agree that God is, then how can we propose to know, even have a concept of the grandness, of the greatness and the truth of what that really means? So the best of our traditions, and all of our traditions teach this, the best of our traditions teach also tremendous humility in trying to understand the infinite. And how can I, I'm a pretty smart guy, I, I teach in a university, and uh, I have lots of colleagues who are Muslims, who are Christians, and who are Jews who disagree with me, and who are a lot smarter than I am, and I know that. And so I'm, how can I say that I'm right and they're wrong? That's disputed. Some people say yes. Some people say it's growing because of demography, not because of conversion. Some people are saying it's not, even. That Christianity is also growing quite a bit. So I, I, if I was a Christian yeah. or Jew or a Hindu? The one thing we do know is that Judaism is not growing. Yeah. <laughs> And 
and, and you would be, it would be okay for you to say that because you are not a believer. But how do we know that you're right? I don't know. Yeah. But you see, but you see, I would see, I would argue that the person who stands up and says, I am right, is by definition wrong. But the person who stands up and says, this is what I believe, this is what I think, this is what I would like to try to understand and explore, that person I will give credibility to. What would you say to someone if you said that? Let's, we have to, okay, yeah, just let me. That's an easy one. It's a free country. <laughs> and yeah, any yes. I think the, the real question is emerging here. We want to appreciate the beauty of other religions, but we also want to or don't want to religionize our own. And the question is, and how can we appreciate the dazzling beauty of other religions without religionizing our own? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think it's a very big question, but we have a very yeah. short answer. Yeah. Yeah, so the question, I'll just repeat the question. How, how, how can we appreciate the dazzling beauty and wisdom of another religious tradition and yet not simply relativize or, or, or disdain or in some way negativize our own religious tradition? How can we still love our tradition and yet really respect a tradi a, the other, an, another tradition? Is that? Relativize, I mean, you know, uh, that's the whole one. I mean, I think a religious psychology pushes us towards to absolutize our own tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the normal behavior of a religious mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. Wants to have that as the only truth. But I mean, if you have that, I mean, if you have to absolutize to that degree, then you degrade other religions because mm -hmm. they are just you know, around there. Mm -hmm. Mind. But the question then. Uh, so I, I'm going to answer this as a Jew. Okay, not as a, an academic. In, in my tradition, um, uh, most Jews believe that they're right. Um, I think that's just a kind of a normal position. But there is something about the way we study. We study, we have a tradition of study which is kind of, um, maybe it's unique, I'm not sure. We, in our, our traditional form of study is, you study with a partner, you read the text of a scripture, interpretation, law, whatever it is, you're always reading with a partner, and you're always taking counter positions with one another, and you're always arguing. Uh, Jews like to say that we argue with one another all the time. We can't agree about anything. But there's a, there is actually a cultural tradition of discourse where we are trained kind of culturally to argue, to argue it. So what that does is, to a certain extent, that does relativize everything. Because if God appears this way in this, in this verse and appears differently in this verse. Well, which one is right? And so we take two positions and you argue it. And you argue it to death, really. You just, you keep going. And then you realize you can't find an answer. And the, the Talmud, which is the quintessential literature, religious literature in Judaism, is a volume the size of the Encyclopedia Britannica and it gives no conclusions. It's almost all it is, is a, is a collection, it's almost like a recording of arguments in the, in the academy, of people arguing over various topics and, and bringing out wisdom and citing new verses and counterpoints and back and forth and back and forth. And there is no legal, uh, some people call it a book of law, it's not a book of law, there's no law there. Legal books are then derived from it but it itself leaves all the questions open and it always, even when it arrives at a conclusion, it always in keeps the a position that wasn't accepted. It always keeps it and honors it. So within that system, one develops a kind of, kind of relativistic perspective. On the one hand, you emotionally feel deeply attached to your own tradition, but you're willing to accept the possibility that you can argue against it. And um, that, for me personally, has allowed me to engage with my Christian and Muslim colleagues in a number of different projects that resulted in books and lots of articles where we argue with one another 
and we respect one another. So we just came out, there's a new book that just came out last month. It's called, I don't remember the name of it. But it's Jews and Christians and Muslims who spent three years meeting with one another. And it's, uh, the purpose of the book is to try to understand the meaning of truth in your own tradition with humility, understanding that there is also a truth in the counter, in the other tradition, which is going to undermine your view of truth. So how do you deal with both of them? It's, a, it's an interesting book and it, it, it also, uh, in the book there's also a discussion about the kind of uh, biographies of the people who are involved in it. So it's kind of fun, fun to read, but it's an academic book, so it may not be that fun. 